Good morning, everybody. Buenos dias a todos y todas y todes. My name is Vivian Weitzner, and I'm an adjunct professor here in the Department of Anthropology at McGill University, and also a research fellow with the Center for Indigenous Conservation and Development Alternatives, which is housed in the anthropology department here. I just want to start with some housekeeping um, pieces before we do the official opening. And I wanted to also welcome those of you who are on the um, Zoom. Um, there is English, Spanish, and French translation. So for people in this room, please make sure you have your headsets um, to let you know English is on channel one, French is on channel two, and Spanish is on channel three. And for those of you online, you can find the translation in the toolbar at the bottom on the little globe. You just click it and you choose your language. Um, so we're going to be speaking mostly in English at the beginning, and then we're going to be speaking in Spanish. So we hope you can, you know, just be quick to put on your headsets if you need to. Um, and um, we also want to let you know that the Zoom is being recorded and so is the room being filmed. So if you feel uncomfortable with being having your image or being part of that film, which is going to be available for people afterwards, um, you can also join us through Zoom and then you wouldn't be part of the room uh, filming. So I just wanted to let you know that that is taking place. Um, and that's about it for the housekeeping. And I'm just going to turn it to Cody to open our roundtable. Uh, Governor Dio Cody Daibo Yujats, uh, elected council chief for the Mall Council of Kanawage. So uh, before we begin there, I think it's important that uh, like we did on the weekend, just to do some words. Uh, mine's a bit of an abbreviated one, so we'll be quick. Uh, so, Dating <laughs> So in my culture, it's usually customary before we meet and discuss important things that we clear our mind. And it's important that we give thanks for everything in the natural world. So we begin starting with thanking all the people who are gathered here today. Then we give thanks to Mother Earth herself. Then we give thanks to all the waters. Uh, then we give thanks to all the animal life in the waters. Then we give thanks to all the grass, the roots, the medicines. We give thanks to all the wild fruit. We give thanks to all the wild animals. We give thanks to all the sustenance of life. We give thanks to all the trees. We give thanks to all the birds and the insects. We give thanks to our grandfather, the thunders. We give thanks to the four winds. We give thanks to our brother, the sun, who's been very kind to us uh, this past week. Um, we give thanks to grandmother, the moon. We give thanks to all the stars. And then we give thanks to the creator. Uh, because it's an abbreviated one in the end there, it's sort of a, a rounding of everything, giving thanks to everything that maybe wasn't captured within each section. Uh, it's really important that we do that. That was the instructions from the creator uh, since uh, since he created us. Um we have stories about times when we had forgotten that. Uh, and then there was times of peril. Uh, people who were on the weekend, Otsita Karna, had explained it in great depth. Um, so it's just, while we're going forward, especially discussing things as climate action and climate and, uh, justice, I, I think it's important that we remember that the natural world also needs validation, just like humans. Uh, we need to give thanks for everything that's there. Um, and just for some opening words, I'd like to thank everybody as well. So right now we're in Jojage, we're in Montreal. 
historically, this was a gathering place of First Nations uh, within the Ganyakahaga territory. Uh, since that time, many things have changed. People who had made the visit to Ganawage on the weekend had seen, uh, I guess, where we've been resorted to reside on uh, because of impositions from colonialism and continue to be uh, burdened. Uh, so we have major infrastructure that went through our territory, uh, including the seaway. Uh, so for the economic benefit of others, we had to lose yet more land uh, and the environment was irreversibly changed at that point. But there has been partnerships uh, and working together through different organizations, through the Mall Council of Ganawage, through the federal government of Canada, and through different private organizations to try and restore a piece of our history. Uh, I hope everybody had a great time there uh, just to see what partnerships can actually do. Uh, and when we work together, rather than having opposing views, uh, together we can tackle any situation. That's how I feel, as long as we put our good minds together and approach it as one and realizing, uh, you know, our places. Uh, so with that, uh, I won't be able to stay the entire time. I will have to leave uh, very shortly, but I just wish everybody a very good meeting. Uh, everybody who's on Zoom who can participate as well, uh, as Ozita Garna had stated on the weekend, uh, you're taking time out of your busy lives as well to talk about important things, and that's what counts at this point. Uh, so uh, I wish us all good well, uh, good health, uh, and working together closely. Niamagoa. Thank you so much, Cody. So I'm just going to say a few opening things. You've already heard who I am, my name and my title. And um, usually I live uh, in the unceded sacred territory of the Algonquin First Nation, north of Ottawa in eastern Quebec. And I'm a first generation Canadian, um, having moved here to come to McGill in my, as a teenager from New York. And I've been here ever since. And Ganawagi has a big part of that. I'm not going to go into it. But um, I basically start working on Aboriginal rights issues um, from when I was a student till my age now, which I won't disclose. <laughs> so I, I really feel honored um, and privileged to co-host this important gathering alongside you, Cody. Um, and I also extend thanks to the Gani and Cahaga people for hosting us in their unceded sacred territory, um, especially at this really important time that we celebrated this weekend, which is Canada's National Day for Truth and Reconciliation, where we remember and we reflect on the ongoing legacy of colonialism and the severe ongoing traumas from the residential school system, also the murdered and missing Indigenous women and other structural racist um, legacies and realities of colonialism. And so for the last few days, we've been holding retreat with Indigenous peoples from around Turtle Island and Abiyayala and their academic and non-governmental allies. And together we've been in deep conversations, in ceremony, in dance as well, and growing friendships in alliances. We've been sharing knowledges and experiences around the effects of the climate crisis and pathways to address it. And today we're excited to share now more publicly um, some of the key issues and messages that come from it with students and not so students here at McGill and others across the wor world virtually um, and to gauge then in a broader um, public discussion. Um, so as Cody said, we had a great visit to Ganawagi and uh, we saw the impacts of the seaway on, um, on your people, on your land, but also how they're bringing the land back, how out of clay um, there is now life and various forms of life. There's now corn growing there. And, um, and we're seeing life in many different forms come back out of nothing. And I think that in itself is a message of hope. Um, we had the privilege of um, an opening with El Elder Otsitsenke. Otsitsegarda. And his assistant. Uh, his wife, um, Eileen. He says it's his boss. OK, <laughs> and the message that he gave us was very, very simple. We need to give thanks. We need to give thanks. We need to listen to the original instructions of respect, reciprocity, responsibility and relationships and reverence to all our relations. And giving thanks will show us the way and it will help us to think with one mind, as Cody said, for seven generations to come. Yesterday. Um, we were in this very space, and Minari Ushiwa of the Sapara Nation, who's sitting right on the end here, gave us a tobacco ceremony, and he asked us to use our heart 
to put aside our mind for a little bit and to feel our way forward with our heart, to look for pathways for all of humanity. And so I want to tell you something from my heart this morning. Um, I first presented myself as an academic, as a university prof and a researcher, but my proudest work is my children. I'm a mother. I have, I'm very, very proud of my two children, Saskia and Alejandro, and I'm so proud that Saskia is in her first year here at McGill in geography and environment, like many students from my town. Everybody seems to be going into environment, and um, people are very aware that um, we are in crisis. Um, so this summer was an alarming summer for all of us, and it was particularly alarming, well, for so many people, but for me, and the reason is this. My daughter was tree planting in Alberta. And for many, many of you who are Canadian will know that Alberta was on fire, as so was Quebec and so is British Columbia. Many places across Turtle Island were on fire this summer and then other places experienced tremendous floods. And my daughter was in a tree planting camp because that's how she pays her way through university. And she also really enjoys her job planting trees. And she was inhaling smoke daily. They didn't know when they had to move the camp because fire might be there. And as a mother, that made me panic. I didn't know she was going to be okay. And then when I went to go pick her up in the Ottawa Valley where I live, twice this happened. I got an alarm on my cell phone that a tornado was coming through. And I was on my way to pick up my daughter. What do I do? I'm driving from Wakefield to Ottawa to pick her up at the train station. And what do I do? My, we're all in a tornado. Do I pull over to the side and stop the car and um, hope that my daughter's okay? Or do I continue through the tornado to see that she's okay? These are some of the things we're going to be seeing more and more. I, I experienced that twice picking up Saskia this, this summer, and I call her my vortex, but that was really something. <laughs> that was really something to go through those tornadoes. So, so we feel panic. Um, and, um, and so, but Minari yesterday also said something, and I want to restate this. He said that it's the women, it's the women who will be help us and who will be helping us to design climate solutions in the future. They are the life givers, keepers of knowledge. There's a very important role for women. And, um, and that came out really strongly in our discussions, as we will hear later on, um, that they not only face the greatest impacts, but they also are holders of some of the ways that we can bring the world into balance again. Um, so we need, the point here is we need to listen to them, especially ancestral women who um, are knowledge keepers, and that gives hope. We can, we can, we need to listen to them. Um, so, um, and this is for all of humanity, not just for Indigenous peoples. That was a key message coming out from our discussions. Um, finally, um, I, um, I want to thank the International Development Research Centre of Canada for placing uh, confidence in us and bring, uh, for bringing together this important event, this retreat in record time, also another vortex, I won't talk about that one, but anyway, um, and the Special Rapporteur on um, Indigenous Peoples' right, Rights, uh, Francisco Calizai, who agreed very readily to have this conversation with us today and who's wait, waiting patiently. I'd also want to say that this format that we're using today and this setup of uh, who's going first and how we're doing this conversation came out of um, our meetings yesterday and the autonomous meeting of the Indigenous peoples who were part of this retreat. So that's why the order is the way it is. And we're going to be going next. Cody, maybe you can introduce our next. It's going to be Eve. Uh, oh, sorry, Adrian. Uh, yeah, so I'd like to introduce Adrian uh, from IRDC uh, to kick us off. Thank you, everyone, and thanks, Cody and Vivian, for your introductory notes. Uh, my name is Adrian Di Giovanni. I'm with the International Development Research Center. Um, that's IDRC. Tout d'abord, j'aimerais juste souhaiter la bienvenue à tous les participants. First of all, I would like to welcome all the French speakers who are in the room or online. Uh, we are a, a, a bilingual organization, and we are here, and we can answer questions in French. Go in English now. So as Vivian noted, we're based in Ottawa, which is the unceded, unsurrendered territory of the Algonquin and Anishinaabeg people. The, the one thing I'd add to Vivian's very nice intro is Ottawa is an Algonquin word for trading. It was traditionally a trading area. And, and I find it's always very appropriate for so much of the work we do at IDRC, which is to exchange knowledge and lessons and perspectives and bring people together, which is, I hope, in the spirit of what we're doing today. Um, 
so we're we're a crown corporation. We're we're part of Canada's overseas official development assistance, and and really what we do is support research and researchers in the global south and in Asia, across Africa, Latin America, and the Caribbean. And and we're really based on a, a simple idea. I like to think, which is that when solutions and evidence come from people experiencing challenges and societies, they tend to be deeper and have longer term impacts. And and we, we have lots of evidence verifying that, but it, it's something that's really woven into um, our organization and how we work. And so today I thought we'd tell you a bit about our journey to this point on, on supporting work on climate justice and, and, and how this event came about. Um, to do that, I just wanted to highlight three quick things about our work. They're, they're, they're almost these simple truths, but I, I don't want to go that far. And, and, and the first is a real privilege we have in our work is we get to start by asking the questions. And we don't ask the questions just in the abstract sitting in our office in Ottawa, sometimes we do, but it, it's we, we hear from partners around the world who are st struggling with challenges, working on issues. And when we say, well, what is climate justice? What does it mean? How can we support people? And then we often go out in the world, find people who know more about things than us, and then try to make sure these are these the right questions because that's how research starts through questions and and international development is is riddled with stories of people showing up with solutions and just trying to say here this is what you have to do and and lots of scholarly articles and from universities like McGill saying how often that doesn't work or can even cause more harm and so starting with the questions and and then the next thing is then in any issue or challenge we focus on there's always a, a combination of of new and old and, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a second about climate. And we already heard a bit about that from Vivian. And, and then finally, when we frame issues, it's always a tough balance between, are we talking about challenges, the problems, the deficits, or, or are we emphasizing our aspirations? What are the changes we're trying to bring about? A more positive narrative. And, and, and on climate, it's, it's very hard to find that balance, if I'm honest. And so, so how do these apply to our work on climate justice and, and where did it begin? A few years back, we, we didn't use the word climate justice. We weren't talking about it. And actually in the world, it, there was less of a conversation. There was a lot about litigation and, and God bless those teenagers taking their governments to, to court. I'm a lawyer by training, but but all, also a lot about historical injustices and, and really that people who face the largest impact of climate changes in societies around the world are the ones who have contributed the least and, and stand to face greater challenges because they're already in situations of vulnerability, inequality. Those are some concepts that we're there. And what we could see is that climate change is, is having huge impacts fundamentally on our lives, on people's rights. Viviane told us her story, weather patterns are, are, are having an impact um, just on our day to day, but you know, just people's livelihoods there we, we're all feeling it in different ways and so i, I won't go into it too much because we'll hear from um, our, our fellow participants later um, but we're also concerned with the impacts not just of climate change but climate action and those are the efforts to either mitigate climate change or adapt to it and and this is where you know the impacts of climate change the effects on people's human rights that's somewhat new we haven't really experienced that what's less new is how all the changes to ch adapt to it, to change the way we organize our cities, to bring about clean energy, all of that, that's gonna be, it's echoing old models from the past of how we do large development projects, whether infrastructure, whatnot. And, and that really, we, we have lots of lessons of how it's 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 riddled with risks. And, and this is again here, you can quickly focus on the negative challenges, the threats, and some of them are, fairly old and, and the discussions we've been having um, over the past few days is really, we're, we're, we're back to, especially when you get to America's discussions about self-determination, land rights, recognitions of traditional ways of life and knowledge. Those are long issues. I learned about those issues some moons ago in this very university and, and we hear them echo, but we hear them colliding with faster forces that are coming at us in a much faster way in, in, in terms of climate change. And, um, and so at IDRC, when thinking about what does climate justice mean for us, I'll say it quickly, we, we, we started to think about procedural justice, what's the process for people to ensure their voices are heard, they're at the table for decision-making processes when historically many people have been excluded. And now here's a new set of issues, new set of responses. Are their voices being heard? And, and, and there's huge challenges. 
We also think about distributional justice is the word of, when decisions are made, wh who's winning by getting access to a nice clean energy grid or not, for example. But really, we try to frame it in terms of, of positive terms of transformational justice. This idea of build back better, we heard in the pandemic, which maybe we already have some hard lessons that use these moments for action, for coming together, for fundamental shifts in societies in terms of action and impacts to try to redress some longer standing historical wrongs, exclusion, inequalities. Easier said than done. That's to frame this challenge and not the solution. And one thing I really took away from our discussions this past weekend is in, in doing that and thinking about redressing longer standing structural issues, think about the intergenerational aspect. Think about generations, the seven generations in the future. And as someone who's thought a lot about human rights over the last number of years, it's somewhere we just got it wrong. And I'm willing to have that discussion that we in human rights, we didn't think about the future the way we should have, especially the links to the environment. It's coming along, there's people doing that, but it was very much about a here and now in this space here. And so um, just to say then, the reason we, we're all here is that there's a big conference on climate change, climate adaptation called Adaptation Futures, starting at the Palais des Congrès tonight and tomorrow, IDRC. We have lots of climate experts coming here. I, I sit with the democracy and justice experts, whatever that means. And, and, and just to reiterate, one thing is when we were having discussions with our climate change colleagues, we came together justice people, climate people, what does this mean? Really this issue is women leadership came out front and center and how do you ensure that's there as part of the solution with our, our especially our, it's across IDRC, but especially with our colleagues who work on climate change, that, that was front and center. And so, so a, there's a conference, lots of academics, smart people, practitioners, thinking about the adaptation side. And we thought, well, we really wanna bring this issues of climate justice issues of indigenous peoples in America. That was the issue when we said, what does this mean in Latin America? How can we support research change processes? Um, and so since everyone was coming together here, we thought, well, no, take the opportunity to have a larger discussion, not just the panel. And so we approached Cicada and then through Cicada, the, the way we start to think about issues and then really work on them is through partnership. And, and, and so I would just end and uh, thank, Huge note of gratitude and thanks to all our partners who travel from Latin America, who, who at a certain point take a bet on us, take a chance, let's let's follow. And 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 through them we learn they are doing research projects over two, three years. But then there's Fundacion Avina who are doing and Liba Lula who are who are doing the whole Latin America pavilion at this big conference. They kind of took a bet at like, let's come together a few days to discuss, but really to Cicada, who we said, hey, what about this last minute? Why don't we bring some of your partners, some of you thinking, because you've been thinking about this much longer, you know much more about this. And then you even to Cody and to the Mohawk Council of We're very much focused outside of Canada on issues as they play out and thinking about what does it mean to decolonize knowledge systems and, and, and funding. But really to do this in Canada, we, we had a sense that it had to be linked to Canada's experience of indigenous, with indigenous peoples legacies of colonialism we couldn't have done that alone and 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 that's really a, thanks to Cicada and really giving us the trust to build on your long-standing relationships and then thanks to Cody especially for welcoming us into your community I'm, I'm a kid from Montreal I'd never done that and it was really to take things you know from the abstract and make it concrete and really feel it as you say <laughs> in a very visceral personal level and, and and thanks to everyone so all in there we're around, please come see me. Or if you have questions online, we're happy to answer more questions, but I really wanna give space now to participants. So thank you everyone for joining us for this discussion. Okay, and now I'll introduce Eve. Thank you. Uh, I feel like I'm the outsider in the room today. So uh, my name is Eve Terriou. Don't try to pronounce the last name or even the first name. Um, I, I'm francophone by, you know, was born in uh, Eastern Quebec and Gaspé Peninsula, but now I do live in uh, in Newfoundland, which is the traditional ter territory of the Biotok. Um, so I work at the department called Crown Indigenous Relations and Northern Affairs. That is uh, a department that's changed names, I don't know, many times over the years. One of the oldest departments in Canada has been there to, um, well, I'll try not to get too much into politics this morning. That's probably not the intent. Um, anyway, 
So I do manage a program um, to support Norton communities in Canada. So from Yukon up to Labrador, so to adapt to the, the impact of climate change. So some of the speakers already mentioned some of the impacts uh, or how the, the people in South America um, are facing the challenges of climate change. Um, the North, pretty similar, uh, you know, communities up, up there are not well equipped to, to deal with that. And the changes are happening very, very quickly. Similarly, in a lot of First Nations uh, in Canada as well, because of location, those those communities are more at risk and anyone else. So that's where we come into play as uh, as federal partners. Our main goal, you know, I work particularly in the north. I've got colleagues that manage other programs supporting First Nations um, in provinces, and our goal is to be a broker. So basically, tell us what are your needs, and we'll try to work with you to navigate the federal kind of system to to find help so you can you know maintain your way of life your traditional uh, activities and we can make sure that you can prosper and develop within your own communities so this is what we do on the on a daily basis and uh, i'm privileged to have a chance to to work directly with those communities because you know I'm in Newfoundland. I was in Ottawa before pandemic. Work from home now, but I'm disconnected from you know a lot of the reality that's happening in those small communities. I mean, I work with communities as small as you know 35, 40 people. Um, so if I don't meet with them, they won't feel that you know there's ears uh, for them to help. So we do travel, we meet with those communities all the time to make sure we can support them. And that's very, very important to to be able to work directly with those people, the contact, um, and the contact with the youth, with the elders, um, the woman that was mentioned as well. I mean, solutions to climate change are part of everyone's duties and responsibilities. And how can we make sure we you know, work all together in, in, to go in the same direction. So this is something that I'm very proud. I've been doing that since 2009. So it's been a, you know, a few years already. Um, and every morning I get up, uh, you know, very happy to go to work because I feel that you know, there's there's a lot we can do. There's still hope to to address the impacts of climate change and change things if we actually put the efforts in. So very happy to be here today. I'm not sure what exactly would be my role. So I'll be, I guess, learning that through the morning. But uh, feel free to ask me any questions about the work we do. Um, there's also an initiative. I uh, may have the chance to talk a bit more later. It's called Indigenous Climate Leadership. So this is a, a new flagship from the federal government looking at transferring ownership of uh, federal programs and giving um you know, communities to be in the driver's seat when it comes to implementing programs related to climate change adaptation uh, and climate change in general. So we're working on that right now with most of the uh, main indigenous groups uh, through uh, engagement process. And hopefully, you know, in a few years, we're able to uh, transfer that that role and responsibility to people that actually know what what's their needs better than than we do within the federal system. Thank you, Eve. Uh, and actually, forgot my manners. I wanted to give uh, Vivian a, a thank you for her opening remarks. There, it was very wonderful. I mean, get a round of applause for Vivian. <laughs> thank you. As well as Adrian, as well for for his words. And again, for Eve, uh, apologies. I forgot uh, my mind is elsewhere today. Uh, very busy week. Um, with the uh, September 30th Truth and Reconciliation Day. Uh, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce the UN Special Rapporteur on uh, Indigenous uh, People's uh, Rights, uh, Francisco Calize. I hope I pronounced that right, so it's nice to meet you. Uh, maybe one day we can meet in person. Um, I'm always open to meeting with individuals, so uh, thank you. Sekachiu Nohir Chupani Dokoleha Hau Kainoh I'm at your six cherry canewage a camal be chico no her a cono her y catit camamao her can secar secar che y bueno her good morning to all of you it is a pleasure and a great honor and privilege to join you today uh, and share remarks uh, for this workshop 
I would like to thank uh, McGill University, the International Development Research Center of Canada, and the Mohawk Council of Kanewage for organizing this event and raising awareness about the fundamental role that indigenous peoples play in climate uh, justice and action. Last week, uh, uh, I presented to the Human Rights Council my report on my official visit to Canada, conducted in March of this year. I have, see, I, I have been asked to say a few words on my finding before discussing Indigenous people role in advancing climate action and justice. So Canada has made progress toward the promotion and protection of the rights of Indigenous peoples formally by advancing domestic implementation of the United Nations Declaration on the Right of Indigenous Peoples with passage of federal uh, legislation in 2021. The United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples Act requires Canada to harmonize its legislation with the rights set out in the, the UN Declaration, to table an action plan and to issue, issue annual progress report. The action plan sets out 181 measures for implementing the legislation and the declaration more generally including measures to develop guidance of free prior and informed consent regarding natural resources, projects and indigenous rights monitoring, oversight, recourses or remedy mechanisms. Canada is also at the forefront of indigenous-led conservation effort through its indigenous guardianship program and other initiative. Prime Minister Trudeau recently announced federal funding for a number of large-scale indigenous-led conservation projects. It is laudable that Canada has taken many important steps to advance indigenous people's rights. However, it is regrettable that significant achievements are often acquired through court decision or case settlements rather than implementation of governmental policies and these advances are ultimately the result of indigenous people strong determination and unbated uh, uh, courage to defend their rights impact of climate change uh, indigenous peoples as we all know indigenous people have contributed the least to the current climate crisis but suffer the greatest consequences. Indigenous people generally inhabit territories most vulnerable to weather phenomena brought about by climate change, including islands, high altitude, tropical rainforest, coastal regions, deserts, and polar areas. While floods, droughts, forest fire, and extreme temperature are affecting everyone in different ways, the consequences are greater for indigenous people who directly depend on their lands, territories, and resources for their survival. Examples include the impact of the, meeting glacier, the melting glaciers on the Inuit of the Arctic, the disappearance of the Pacific island inhabited by indigenous peoples, the relocation of the Kuna people in Panada, Panama because of the sea level rise, and the scar Car city of water and the highlands of Bolivia. As I discussed in the report on my country visit to Canada, the impact of climate change alongside hydroelectric power projects and clear cutting of forests on the Inu territory of Passamit in Quebec has negatively reshaped, reshaped, reshaped subsistence lifestyles leading to the loss of culturally significant species, such as caribou. The Passamit are fighting to maintain their culture and, and indigenous knowledge and ask Quebec to engage in meaningful consultations to provide a restitution of land and compensation for the loss of resources. First Nations, Metis, and Inuit people, particularly in the North, are increasingly experiencing the negative effect of climate change that threaten community health and safety, and safety, leading to evacuation and additional risk to community members who experience housing insecurity. Vivian just summarized uh, the meeting that you have yesterday and as uh, on the only hope that we have, that is why a special attention should be paid to indigenous women and girls who are disproportionately affected by loss of land, territory and resources due to climate change. Climate change worsens 
pre-existing condition of poverty and discrimination, reducing access to natural resources, and making women's living condition in their territory in their territory more difficult. The effect of climate change have forced many indigenous men to migrate to the cities, which increased the workload of their partners in agricultural work and child care. Likewise, when indigenous women migrate to cities, many of them are forced to work in informal sectors of the economy, increasing the risk of labor and sexual exploitation and poverty. In addition, they lose the leadership role that they had in their communities as bearers of scientific and, technology, and, te and technical knowledge. And, and I'm going to emphasize, emphasize this uh, because indigenous people have scientific knowledge, not as uh, many people said that is a uh, customary knowledge or uh, traditional knowledge. I believe personally that this a scientific knowledge that the indigenous people have when they live, uh, and especially they lose this, uh, this scientific knowledge when they leave the lands where they practice and develop their knowledge. Indigenous women are also disproportionately impacted by the effects of extractive industry in the, on their lands. Their knowledge is the, the, the value when the natural resources they steward are exploited without their free prior and informed consent. Loss of access to and ownership of land disempower indigenous women. Moreover, climate change gives new urgency to the recovery and preservation of indigenous women's scientific knowledge. With women often leading the effort to protect their lands and resources from external threats, the criminalization of indigenous environmental defenders has been well documented. For example, in Guatemala, a Mayan spiritual leader and a defender of indigenous people's rights was harassed, kidnapped, and accused of witchcraft after, the, after she opposed a mining project that contaminated the waters of Lake Isabel. New, newly developed policies must recognize and implement gender-based approaches that address the unique impact of the climate crisis on indigenous women and girls. Measures must be adopted to eliminate systemic institutional racial discrimination and implicit bias that indigenous women and girls face in accessing emergency responses. Particularly attention should also be given to indigenous elders who are generally the holders and transmitters of indigenous scientific knowledge culture and language, and require special attention due to their greater vulnerability to the health impact of climate change. Despite their important contribution to protecting biodiversity, an agent of transformation in the face of the challenges posed by climate change, indigenous people are often excluded from the design and implementation of environmental programs and continue to be dispossessed of their lands for conservation areas. Climate change programs, national parks, and game reserves, as outlined in my 2022 report to the General Assembly on protected areas. <clears throat> uh, I indicated that the increase in protected area along with not addressed climate changes, unless other substantive measures are taken, first, that the real drivers of climate change be addressed uh, and that those causing the climate crisis change their consumptions patterns and reduce carbon emission. Second, that indigenous people are included as a stakeholders and right holders, recognizing their knowledge and capacity of managing and stewardship the world's biodiversity regions. My 2019 reported to the Human Rights Council on COVID-19 recovery emphasized indigenous people's resilience, strength, and hope for the future. If the pandemic has shown us anything, it is that we need to change our relationship with our planet. It is scientifically proven that there is a correlation between deforestation and zoonotic disease. In this regard, Indigenous people have played a paramount role in the protection of nature and ecosystems. Indigenous-led conservation and climate actions, opportunity for Indigenous people to shape adoption and climate policy frameworks. Well, Indigenous people's scientific knowledge, collective land tenure system, and sustainable management of resources have, have preserved and conserved our planet for centuries. 
Proving that respect for our right is a fundamental step to achieving sustainable and effective conservation goals. Indigenous people make up just 5% of the global population, but are protecting 80% of the world remaining biodiversity. Historically, we the knowledge of indigenous people has enabled us to cope with different climate changes and to ensure food security. For example, in the Andes, the Inca people developed scientific knowledge about crop diversification, genetic diversity, bed cultivation, agroforestry, climate forecasting, and water harvesting that is still used in agriculture today. In Kenya, the knowledge of agropastoralist people about fauna, flora, the moon, winds, among others, allow them to pre predict droughts. Indigenous people are able to document their knowledge, monitor their knowledge, monitor the climate, develop response and early warning system to face disasters, apply their traditional agricultural techniques, protect and restore forest, manage coastal marine areas and preserve their ways of life. Their knowledge is critical to managing the risk and impact of climate change, protecting biodiversity, achieving sustainable development and building resilience in the face of pandemics and other extreme events. In 2021, during the 26th meeting of the UN Climate Change Conference, the parties recognized the important role of indigenous peoples and their scientific knowledge in mitigating climate change and biodiversity laws. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change stated that recognizing indigenous peoples' self-determination and other rights and supporting adaptation measures based on indigenous people's knowledge is fundamental to reduce climate change risk and achieving effective ad adaptation. Although international conferences on climate change have begun to recognize the important role that indigenous people can play in addressing climate change, the measures that have been taken so far are insufficient. I would like to emphasize that indigenous knowledge is contemporary and dynamic not static and fixed on in time. It is sophisticated set of understanding of no less value than other kinds of knowledge. To recognize this, I have adopted the terminology, as I said before, of scientific and technical knowledge in place of traditional or customary knowledge. Indigenous women have a leadership role in climate change adaptation and mitigation that must be empowered. Last year, my report to the Human Rights Council focused on indigenous women and the development, application, preservation, and transmission of scientific and technical knowledge. In this report, I highlight the importance of recognizing the role that indigenous women knowledge can play in mitigating and ad adapting to the devastating cons consequences of climate change. I explained that indigenous women are often the custodians of a collective accumulation of scientific knowledge and technical skills related to food and agriculture, natural resources management and weather patterns. For example, in Kenya, Ogiek and Sengwe women practice beekeeping, harvesting honey for food and medicinal, medicinal purpose as a, an important element of forest conservation in support of biodiversity. Women of the Kimberley region of Australia, who are guardians of the Fitzroy River, are speaking up to protect the interests of their com communal life-sustaining resources, preserving its health for present, for present and future generation. In Northern Thailand, the Shang Lua and Aka indigenous women use protection methods of sharing seeds, seeds between the community to ensure food security and limit any possible risk of extinction. Indigenous women in Asia are primary agricultural producer and the community, but changing climate change pattern, causing drought, floods, and hurricane disrupt agricultural product production, forcing them to find work in urban areas. In Canada, the Cascadene are just one of many First Nations that are leading their own conservation initiative by establishing indigenous protected and conserved areas governed through the indigenous law and knowledge system. Notably, indigenous women are leading two thirds of the 23 proposed IPCA uh, of the Indigenous Leadership Initiative and nearly half of 
and nearly half of the indigenous land guardian programs that manage, restore, and monitor protected area. And now uh, the role of international conservation organization and corporation. I believe that a transition to indigenous led conservation and climate change action is necessary to end the practice of fortress conservation. Many large conservation organizations continue to engage in this exclusionary approach to protect biodiversity, which has led to violent eviction, militarized violence, and the dispossession of the lands of indigenous peoples, who are the best stewards of the nature. The eviction of indigenous people from protected area, areas to the loss of irreplaceable land, sacred places and resources, and of the transmission of knowledge system, culture, language, identity, and livelihood. Such violations are all compounded by, in, by the threat of climate change. Incorporating indigenous land into protected area in this manner takes management and control away from indigenous peoples and allow states to define the rules, administration, and use of, this, of those lands, often under the influence of financial, powerful international conservation organizations. Indigenous people have expressed the concern that Western conception of land management are devoid of many meaningful human connection with the land. In many parts of the world, indigenous people view the creation of protected area as a form of colonization and seeks to decolonize conservation. Meanwhile, in some countries with greater recognition of indigenous land rights, indigenous people are using protected area status to defend their territories against extractive activities. The extractive industry is not only responsible for half of global greenhouse gas emissions, and 90% of biodiversity loss, but it is also at the cause of conflict created by criminalization of indigenous peoples defending their land and resources from companies and government who support their projects. On several occasions, this mandate has expressed concern regarding human rights abuses against indigenous people committed by Canadian companies operating abroad. The UN Treaty Monitoring Body have called on Canada to adopt a regulatory framework to hold these transnational corp corporations accountable for human rights violations. According to the information received, Canada is home to almost half of the world pub publicly listed mining and mineral exploration companies, and 200 companies are represented in 97 foreign countries. In 2022, Canada launched the Responsible Business Conduct, RBC, a strategy to promote good practices of business operating abroad in accordance with the UN guiding principle on business and human rights through prevention, legislation, and no judicial dispute resolution mechanism. Canada has two dispute resolution mechanisms competent to consider allegations of human rights abuses committed by Canadian corporations abroad. The Canadian National Contact Point, NCP, established further to the OECD guidelines for multinational enterprises and the Canadian Ombudsperson for Responsible Enterprises, CORE. The responsibility to respect human rights is a global standard of expected con conduct for all business wherever they operate, and the state has extraterritorial obligation to take steps to prevent and redress infringement of these rights committed abroad by business and entities over which it exercises control. Criminalized and land defenders. In Canada, indigenous people are taking up the fight for climate justice by opposing the construction of the TC Energy Coastal Gas Link and the federal government-run Transmountain Pipeline projects approved without the consent of all impacted indigenous peoples. TC Energy signed benefit agreement with the Iran Council along the pipeline road, but did not obtain the consent of Heritarian chief who assert jurisdiction of reserves. Jurisdiction of reserves. The, the use of the injunction and exclusion zone around the work site have led to the, to the criminalization of indigenous opposition to the pipeline. Despite the UN Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination urging Canada to, crease, uh, to cease forced eviction of West Sub-Witten people from their land, 
The federal police conducted a series of raids using tactical officers, helicopters, assault rifles, and police dogs to arrest 74 wet sweating people. Land defenders have also been arrested and charged after blocking the Transmontane Pipeline Road. Direct financing to indigenous peoples uh, uh, to invest in biodiversity and carbon stewardship. In my report this year on green finance, I discussed the international funding of projects, program and initiative that promote sustainable development and climate change action and its impact on indigenous people's rights. To date, climate financing has not allocated sufficient funds to support indigenous people's led initiative, advance the recognition of their collective rights, preserve their ways of life, or protect against violence by third parties. In 2022, both the Conference of Party to the Climate Convention and the Convention on Bi Bio Biological Diversity made commitments to advance the protection of indigenous people's rights over their territories. At COP26, governments and philanthropic organizations pledged 1.7 billion US dollars to advance the recognition of indigenous people's rights over their territories and the protection of tropical rainforests. However, the lack of transparency in reporting and monitoring the mechanism makes evaluating compliance with these commitments difficult. difficult. Following the 1.7 billion pledge and the finding that international funding does not effectively reach indigenous peoples and their own projects, studies emerge to provide donors and investors with principles, standards, and mechanisms to make their green investments sustainable by providing financial support to indigenous people to secure their tenure rights and forest guardianship. Several factors have prevented the direct financing of indigenous people's projects. My mandate has previously observed how national governments may impose onerous reporting requirements on indigenous peoples who are seeking funding for management of their resources and sometimes involve non-indigenous third parties in the management of the funding. Indigenous governance institutions apply for funds are expected to respond between relate, relatively short time frames to government issued notice. The, this one is placed on them to carry out studies and develop evidence identified and supporting their concern. Funding practice and grant design need to be modified to enable indigenous people to access, manage, and benefit from funds more easily and quickly. Funding must be cha channeled in ways that are relevant and appro appropriate for indigenous peoples. Funding and engagement should as far as possible be led by indigenous peoples. Be flexible, long-term, gender inclusive, timely and accessible, accessible and ensure accountability. Transformative change need to occur in the practice and infrastructure of climate and conservation funder, including international NGOs, private foundation and philanthropic bodies and government agencies to accommodate the worldview and re realities of indigenous people and support indigenous peoples that self-determination. Access to capital alone may be insufficient. Capacity support to help indigenous people hire external legal, financial, and technical experts and gain experience through deal makings is likewise important. As part of the transition, no to direct financing, indigenous people should be supported to build their own technical unit between their organization so that they can meet the minimal requirement of donors and other funders. As called for for by indigenous people COP27, there shall be an independent indigenous-led global green funding mechanism to support coordination, solidarity, experience, and knowledge sharing, and lobbying, and advocacy work for indigenous people from the seven social cultural region. I will end by emphasizing the sec the, that, that securing the collective land rights and self-determination of indigenous people over their territory is necessary component of green financing and instrumental for the conservation of biodiversity and climate change adaption. I'm sorry for being long, uh, but uh, this is the, the, the idea that I wanted to share with you. Thank you very much for your attention.
Thank you so much for that very uh, comprehensive summary of um, some of the reports and, and thinking and experiences that you have um, that, that you've brought to the table. I just want to let people know I'm going to start speaking in Spanish. So if you need to um, put on your headphones, um, please, please go ahead. Bueno, muchísimas gracias. Buenos días, eh, Francisco Calizay. Thank you very much, uh, Francisco Calizay. It's an honor to have you here with us. And uh, so now we would like to move on to the second part of our roundtable, where we're going to be listening to the participants uh, from our retreat. They uh, themselves were the ones to decide on this format. So we're going to have three minutes for each person who will take the mic. And um, I will be very strict about this because they asked me to be strict. So it will be three minutes. So apologies in advance, but I will have to cut people off at three minutes. We're going to begin with Marisol Garcia from the Quechua people. She is the president of the Quechua Jasunte Amazon Quechua uh, People's uh, Association. Please go ahead. Thank you very much for that introduction and for this opportunity, and thanks to everyone here. I would like to begin by uh, speaking directly to Mr. Francisco Cali, who in his report on uh, protected areas and indigenous people's rights, the uh, obligations of states and responsibilities of uh, or international organization. I would like to share with him that in the Peruvian state, conservation is still an uh, exclusive and colonial conservation. It excludes indigenous peoples, and our rights as human beings are not recognized. I would also like to share uh, with you that in uh, 2008, the uh, Southern Cordillera Park was created, and also the Cerro Escalera Park was created created in 2005, both of them were created without the consent or even consultation uh, with us. So these areas were taken, uh, removed from our territory. And today, what is most unfortunate is that these uh, li living spaces, which are our home, are being used to give this green uh, front to uh, multinational organizations, which are only um, uh, really taking advantage of people. These lands do not just belong to Indigenous peoples, they belong to everyone. And so we have the responsibility of raising our voices uh, around this climate injustice that has been committed against us on a massive scale. Since 2018, our organization has been working uh, where uh, we have um, carbon uh, credits uh, and uh, there are multinational corporations who uh, have uh, basically they um, they uh, preach the uh, benefits of their solutions. And so they have this green, quote unquote, green image, but they aren't actually, um, you know, recognizing the fact that they are polluting, they are contaminating, and they are causing problems for the people who live there. So there are millions of dollars that uh, reach the Peruvian government um, through these carbon credits. However, not a penny of this money makes it to indigenous people. So I I would like to really underline this climate injustice that is happening on a mass scale and being committed against indigenous peoples. When we talk about uh, climate injustice, we need to uh, talk about what uh, what needs to be done. So the solution to this is that the territories belonging to Indigenous peoples need to be returned to us because we are the ones who have the wisdom and the knowledge to uh, conserve our lands uh, for the benefit of our planet. Thank you very much. Excellent. Uh, three minutes. And uh, here I was uh, thinking that I was going to have to interrupt you, but I did not. So now we're going to uh, go to our speaker from the Embera people from Panama. 
Buenos, buenos días. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? Mi enfoque en este my focus uh, in my intervention will be about strengthening traditional structures uh, and this uh, also has to do with political and economic uh, uh, topics uh, so very little of the funds from international organizations goes towards this uh, these kinds of structures so Within this topic, we talk of autonomy, we talk of territories, culture, and unity. So that is what this process is about. States and international organizations need to recognize the strengths that are not currently being leveraged. There are very significant strengths that we have in Panama, uh, the Embera people. Uh, oh, I, I am a member of the Embera community. Apologies for not having uh, in introduced myself. Um, but we have structures. There are 12 of them in total. And these structures llamadas como de interés o are not considered important for states. So they are spoken of very little. And it's important for me to highlight the fact that uh, these strengths that we have need to be recognized and used. So as the uh, last, uh, the last principle that I mentioned, it was unity, and I would like to talk about that. Today, we should be talking about unity. Our international structures are promoting unity, and so today we need to speak about this because we are all human beings. Uh, it doesn't matter whether we are Black, white, Indigenous. Inician con reconocer que los sistemas indígenas deben adoptarse. They begin by saying that Indigenous structures need to be adapted. There's no focus on uh, cultivating communities. We need to also uh, cultivate the land so that we don't lose our ancestral knowledge. We know that we must listen, but now, today, people must listen to us. Today, we are demonstrating to all those present that we uh, have more indigenous brothers and sisters who are willing to uh, to debate and discuss this planet is ours. There is only one planet, and what happens on it affects all of us. So this is an important point that I really wanted to highlight. Este intercambio intercultural. We are having intercultural exchange, and it's not just about the project that we're looking at today. We need to also have intercultural exchange uh, from now on amongst everyone here present in all projects that we carry out. And so that is the message that I would like to give to those here uh, present. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias, Carlos. Thank you, Carlos, and thank you also for respecting the time frame. Uh, now we are going to Janet Velasco Castillo. She is from the N.A. Uh, Rio Altamankiri people of Peru. Hello. ¿Qué tal? Buenos días. How are you doing? Good morning, everyone. It's Nani Shirambari. Buenos días. Good morning, everyone. Yo creo que se está hablando... I think that uh, here we are talking about climate justice. So my name is Janet Velasco Castillo. I'm from the Ashaninka people, and I am participating as a representative of my indigenous uh, organization the Etne Rio, Etne Rio Kare. So this is a political association that represents 19 communities and uh, 25 annexes. There are two uh, communities that are undergoing initial contact uh, currently, and that is uh, in the Ene River Basin in Peru. 
Bueno, en este espacio también este, hay muchas cosas. In hablar, uh, ¿no? this uh, forum, we have a lot of things to talk about. However, I am going to uh, focus on something because uh, I would like to respect the uh, and take advantage of the three minutes that have been allotted to me. <clears throat> Bueno, nos, nos gustaría también escucharle al relator Francisco. I was uh, pleased to hear from our rapporteur, uh, Francisco, and uh, to hear about the uh, actions that he is leading as part of his work. Me, me, bueno. So I am going to focus on drug trafficking in our region. I, we're seeing this in our region, a lot of regions of Peru. Drug trafficking has increased in our uh, in our region, in the valley known as uh, Abrai, and this is a region where. There, uh, where we have seen a huge impact of drug trafficking during the uh, period of uh, terrorism, particularly so in the 80s and 90s. My brothers and sisters uh, lived uh, through this. Um, that was the worst time. I've also lived through it personally. I had to leave my community and go to a different community uh, in search of safety. However, uh, over 20 years later, our rights are still being violated. For decades, we have been uh, without a uh, state uh, that is able to offer us safety. We have no legal safety. Our territories are not recognized. And uh, we are pleading for uh, a, a call to the Peruvian state to uh, carry out concrete actions. My people, we are not we are not waiting, however, for this. In the meantime, we have our own proposals. Uh, so territorial monitoring, we also have uh, also have economic development initiatives. Uh, and in my, uh, this is what we are doing in my region. We also have uh, uh, coffee and uh, cocoa uh, uh, production. Apologies, but I have to cut you off as that was what was agreed upon. So I'm going to have to be very strict about that. Once again, apologies. Thank you. Thank you very much. We're going to go now to Erika Margarita. Campos, Campos, who is a project leader of uh, climate change adaptation uh, for the Mayan people in Mexico. Thank you very much. Good morning. Today, I am here as a Mayan woman living in the Yucatan Peninsula, and specifically in one of the three states uh, within the Yucatan, which has been recognized as a, a calm uh, and safe uh, space in perhaps the safest uh, area in Mexico. Uh, we also have a lot of natural resources. One of the most important ones is water. However, in our region, in the past few years, we have seen the arrival of projects under the banner of uh, sustainable development, but they are also known as mega projects. So we have had several experiences uh, across the Yucatan Peninsula. So, for example, in Campeche, we started with GMO uh, crops, and this is a huge problem because it has led to deforestation of Mayan forests. It uses vast swaths of land for these GMO crops, and uh, it is a lot cheaper to fertilize using airplanes, using toxic uh, agricultural products, and Lastly, uh, this does not only affect the people around it, but also kills the bees. It filters into the water. We also have um, earth that is very porous, and so these uh, chemicals seep in. We have a lot of experience in uh, the Yucatan, uh, a lot of um, community organizations that are, have been working on uh, these problems for a long time now, and it's 
it's incredible that today it is still a problem and today I, it, it continues to grow and expand uh, in the Yucatan. So we have uh, other experiences, for example, um, pig farms where um, companies and industries have said that they are moving towards a sustainable pig farming. But I think it's important to point out that for these industries, there are no limits. They never say, okay, we're going to um, reach 100, 200, a thousand farms and that's it we're going to stop no it is always about growing more and more earning more and more and setting up more and more pig farms this is not food that is just for the yucatan or even just for mexico it is being exported outside of the country we have also seen the arrival of real estate companies uh, from foreign countries. We've seen gentrification in our cities and our communities. We are also seeing uh, contamination of water that has been caused by uh, renewable energy. They uh, have come to set up uh, sustainable development schemes to produce renewable energy. However, in Mexico to date, we have not seen any community generation uh, energy uh, generation projects. Thank you very much, Erica. Now we're going to go to Luis Jimenez Cáceres, who is a, a lawyer uh, from the Aymana Igualdite community in Chile. Luis Jimenez Cáceres, thank you for the invitation. Lo que tengo que decir. First of all, I would like to thank the uh, Special Rapporteur from the UN for the reports in the uh, process in Chile. Uh, we uh, have to say, unfortunately, that these observations have fallen on deaf ears. The uh, Constitutional Council has um, refused to recognize political and territorial rights of Indigenous peoples. Uh, only cultural rights have been recognized, but in a very limited way and not in line with international standards. On top of this, Recently, the Constitutional Council has been proposing the elimination of the state's uh, obligation to adopt uh, climate change mitigation and adaptation strategies. This uh, measure has not yet been ratified by the Constitutional Plenary. However, it appears it will be thrown out, it will be uh, um, struck down. And so this, of course, affects Indigenous peoples more than anyone as those who are most vulnerable to the effects of climate change. However, with our knowledge and our technology, uh, we are fundamental uh, actors in uh, facing and tackling this challenge. I would like to conclude by saying that Chile has announced uh, its uh, national lithium strategy and uh, also its uh, fair uh, economic program. However, the participation of indigenous peoples has not been included in the development uh, of this uh, program. And as we see in other um, Latin American countries, there is a lack of consultation of indigenous peoples. There is a lack of uh, guarantees of uh, of respect for indigenous people's economic um, uh, autonomy and environmental autonomy. It's still in the hands of, in the hands of uh, whatever the government of the day uh, is. And so, uh, unfortunately, indigenous consultations and participation mechanisms are inefficient uh, for protecting uh, the environment in our country. So we call upon the uh, Special Rapporteur to uh, continue um, making representations to the United Nations uh, regarding uh, our problems in Chile. We need our uh, governance to be respected and uh, we need, of course, for the strategies for climate uh, mitigation adaptation to be adopted. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Luis Jimenez. Now, Mayro Airica, she's the director of environment of Rapa Nui municipality, which is Easter Island. You have three minutes. As the presentation mentioned, I am from Easter Island, known as Rapanui. It belongs to Chile and Polynesia. We have big environmental challenges. We are in the Pacific and we are receiving all the problems that mean being an island in the Pacific Ocean where we are receiving all the plastic coming from the world. And uh, we have an increase in the level of the seawater. And we are also having extreme events that are affecting our climate. We have strong winds, intense rains, and the little soil that we have is going to the sea and it's affecting the, the, the ecosystem. So I want to talk about oceanic plastic. We have an island that was created, that is with the Pacific, uh, uh, South Pacific uh, uh, gyre. So we are receiving every day the plastic and all the garbage that the whole world is uh, throwing to the sea, so the ocean is like a landfill. I was talking with my sister from Panama, and populations or cities that are near to the lakes and the rivers, all the things they throw, they go, it goes to the sea, it goes to the islands, and so you, Rapanui and other Pacific islands. So this is uh, the call we are making a few months ago, well, a month and a half, before our mayor, Pedro El Mospava, he was showing our report on uh, our progress on uh, uh, sustainable objectives, and uh, he made a call because there is a lack of uh, climate justice. Why our kids, our children, adults need to go and pick up that garbage? The idea is to also book, look for cooperation, to look for the responsible ones. We know that we have uh, uh, both factories that they throw every day all the plastic garbage to the ocean. So this is the call. And to finish, I know that one of the sisters is going to mention this, but uh, as uh, you mentioned, to know how to navigate the system in order to find benefits for our communities. So I really hope that you will be able to mention this topic that's uh, important for us. Thank you very much, uh, Bayroa. Manari, do you want uh, to take the floor? Manari Ushiwa, he is from the Saquara Nation, Nation of Ecuador. I would like to thank the special rapporteur for being part of this uh, conference. He explained the report. I just want to tell him that uh, regarding uh, indigenous uh, knowledge, we have made a study to compare to scientific knowledge. And the difference is not very big. It's nearly the same. So our knowledge is a scientific knowledge because we have verified it and it works. So I want to tell you, special rapporteur, when you talk about indigenous knowledge, we have to say that it is a scientist um, knowledge. And what I wanted to say is also a cultural adaptation. We are seen from the forest, climate change, it's already taking place. So we cannot talk here about adaptation in the future. We need to talk about adaptation today. If we do it that way, then 
entre humanos ya no Among podemos. human beings, we cannot establish a difference any longer because we live in planet Earth, humans, cultures. So as cultures, as human beings, we need to get together in order to face this climate change. Los conceptos que están All the concepts that are being used as a sustainable, in nombre de on behalf este of this term, to find fundings. I don't think if this is going to work either, because the world is already changing. I just wanted to say that we need to find for other words that will represent us in a journey of getting aligned in front of the change to our living as human beings and to start to take care of our life spaces, each one of us in the world, in order to face what comes. Thank you. Thank you very much to all of you for your uh, interventions, uh, very specific to each uh, territory. So that's why we decided not to have two people making a summary of the experiences of different peoples, but it, that, it, it, it had to came from each one of the people that are part of the group and acknowledging also that uh, there are relationships, uh, there are common things among uh, all the uh, indigenous people. So I would like to give the floor to the reporter. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm so sorry. Yes, I'm, I, I forgot, I'm really sorry. So Sonia, Sonia Mutubanjoy, I'm so sorry. Okay, so Sonia Mutubanjoy from Putumayo, so she is from the Inga peoples. So we can see you now, reporter. I'm an Inga woman from Putumayo Department in the Indian Amazon Territory. Really, I would like to thank you for the invitation because this allows us to have the voice for the territory. We don't have the opportunity to speak with the uh, special UN Rapporteur for Indigenous Peoples, and I think this is one of the privileges people uh, re seldom have. So the territory where I come from is a very rich and biodiverse territory. It's the source of water. Water is born there for the Amazon territory. We are close to the mountain. Unfortunately, our territory was victim of a lot of struggles in the history of uh, extractivism, gold, oil, rubber, deforestation, and also extra extractivism of knowledge. And indigenous peoples, we were in the middle of the tensions and we were keeping, protecting the think, the thoughts, the knowledge, and we have been told that the territory is the habitat of human beings and spiritual beings. And spiritual beings in these matters, the topics regarding uh, climate justice, apparently they don't seem to be relevant. Currently in my territory, we have, on top of the historical threats that have always been present, we have two situations that I would like to mention here. Recently, a Canadian company, which is uh, Libero Cobre, the name is Libero Cobre, today they are in the territory doing some uh, explorations, and pretty soon they want to exploit copper and molybden in an open uh, pit uh, mine. Uh, very rich, an area rich for the water, biodiversity. So for us, this is an alarm signal. Why? Because the presence of that company today 
it is a small element in the huge mining structure is generating a whole series of situations in the territory, uh, starting with uh, uh, looking, uh, well, the, who are the leaders, polluting the water, threatening the spirituality. And we have to add here as well that the territories of indigenous peoples of Putumayo department they don't have a property titles so we need to make it formal because we don't have the title and all the projects and all the concessions and all the permits are arriving to that territory and we are also receiving all the carbon market and also the companies with the projects to sell us the idea that nature has a price we would like to insist to the rapporteur in this space to put in his reports to urge the states to guarantee the rights of indigenous peoples, full guarantee from the understanding that the territory is integral. It's not only a physical space, not only we are the human beings, it is also a spiritual space. And we understood that the dialogue with spirituality will bring the answer to face all the things related to climate change. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, Sonia. Sorry. Bueno, um... I think there are several questions, but maybe I would like to have the impression from the rapporteur before having the questions from the people that are here present or on online. We will give you eight minutes so you can answer, you can react to you have heard. Vivian, thank you very much. Now I'm going to speak uh, in Spanish, so my brothers and sisters can uh, follow me from uh, South America. I fully agree with most uh, of the ideas that you have shared today, and that's why I did the studies that I presented to the National Assembly, and it is a concern for this uh, uh, office that the funds are not arriving to the indigenous peoples. And I was able to uh, see that if you get 10% of international cooperation to the rights of indigenous peoples, we are talking about a, a lot of a, a lot. So that's why I was talking about the agencies that are inter intermediates and uh, they want to be in the middle and the money remains there. I'm not sure. Well, maybe my English was not uh, English. It was not clear enough in order to explain to you what I said. Nevertheless, one of the bases of the work of, of our office is not the acknowledgement. Is to make known that from structures, traditional structures of uh, authorities of indigenous peoples, where do we have to go, where we have to send the, the funding, the funds. Uh, what Sister from Peru mentioned regarding the drug traffic presence, this is something that is not only happening in Peru, we find it in many places, I think basically in all uh, Latin American countries. Yeah, Friday, I was uh, in Geneva presenting my report. I was with a representation of indigenous peoples from India, and they were also mentioning the same situation, how drug traffic is affecting traditional structures of authority, but also 
the way they are imposing their authority and also controlling the traffic in different indigenous regions. So this is something that is generalized. Of course, I share all mentioned by the sister from Yucatan. I know the uh, poor uh, farm uh, projects, the mega projects, I, and all the renewable energies and, uh, and the real estate one, uh, uh, projects. And we have a mega uh, project of the Maya train. They put it in a way that uh, looked positive for indigenous peoples, but in fact, it has good. It doesn't that that it doesn't have an effect on the biodiversity where the train will pass. I have been in most of those places. Unfortunately, the brother Aymara from Chile is right. They didn't take into account my comments, but we could expect. This is something we could expect especially the way the, the, the Constituent Assembly was being organized. That's why we wanted to express our point of view regarding what you need in a Constituent uh, Assembly in a country like Chile. I'm concerned, I'm deeply concerned, the trend not only in Chile, but also in Bolivia and Argentina, the lithium exploitation, and it is presented as a transition or the alternative to stop the use of fossil fuels. But I have already mentioned this in some of my reports, the green transition cannot be done with the suffering and enforced displacement from territories of indigenous peoples. So I think I made myself very clear in that respect. So sorry, maybe in a next uh, um, presentation, I will do it in Spanish. And uh, my brother from Ecuador, this is the base of my report. I am the one that was uh, fighting with the UN so that uh, it is acknowledged that the knowledge of indigenous peoples is scientific knowledge. We have a big uh, struggle, we have a big uh, discussion with environmentalists, but also in the OMPI, in the uh, intellectual property world organization. They don't want to acknowledge the scientific knowledge of indigenous people. So I have been struggling with all my life with this so that uh, the knowledge of indigenous peoples should to be uh, considered scientific knowledge. In Colombia, sister, on the contrary, for me is a privilege. The privilege is for me to be speaking with you. The work of uh, the office, although uh, the UN is not paying me a single cent to do the work I do, the work I do is that, to have a direct contact with indigenous peoples. Unfortunately, we don't have enough funds in order to be able to see all the uh, indigenous peoples. So they only finance two official visits a year. We have 194 countries, so I will only visit 12 uh, countries. So this is not possible. There are some academic visits and I have to look for those funds and there are not enough funds in order to be able to visit all indigenous peoples. I have been in Colombia two or three times, in Peru, in, in Chile. I will go in October 24 until the 26. Maybe we can see each other. I'm going to be in Santiago. I don't have the funds in order to go to the regions, but I will be in Santiago. So please, we can meet in the night. I can go, I, I will go to a special event. So those three days, but during the night, I can meet with a representation of indigenous peoples. So we have a lot of things here and we need to continue working all together, I agree. And another important thing for everyone, and it is there is information. Press has information, but as a special rapporteur, I'm like the civil lawyer. If I don't have, if they don't ask me, I cannot act. So you need to 
send me the information directly to the office. I'm going to share with the organizers the email addresses in the Zoom chat so she can share that address with you. So please, it would be good for you to write me, ask for, uh, write the petition, and the way we work is from communications with the states. Sometimes they answer, sometimes they don't, but they don't like to be accused that they are violating the human rights of indigenous peoples because they all say they respect those rights. So Vivian, I will stop here. I don't know if there is something else. 80 minutes, I will have to leave because I have another meeting. Uh, so I, I will have to leave in eight minutes. Thank you very much. We have good answers. You dealt a lot of the topics mentioned here. I think there is an urgent question here before you leave. So Hector Jaime Vinasco, go ahead. Bueno, relator, muchísimas gracias a usted por su tiempo. Eh, mi nombre... Thank you very much, uh, Rapporteur, for uh, speaking with us. Um, my question is uh, very specific. If there is an agreement with uh, the states or uh, concrete actions uh, from the UN for compliance with the declaration, particularly in terms of self-determination, I would like to know if that exists. The agreement is simple. The agreement is that they have the obligation of complying with what they have signed, what they have ratified. On top of this, Colombia ratified the um, uh, uh, once, uh, Convention 169 of uh, in the UN as well. Please, I don't want us to get into this uh, discussion as to whether the declaration is binding or not. For me, it is binding. Why? Because the Declaration for uh, the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, simply, uh, is simply what it does is takes the rights that are enshrined in other uh, documents where they are binding, and it brings them all together. So it when it when something is used it is binding when it is uh, when it stops being used it is no longer binding so the question is that or the issue is that as indigenous peoples when we use the this declaration as a foundation for our demands our legal demands uh, before states then it will be binding uh, 75 years after the Declaration of Human Rights, nobody, not a single state, uh, and no human rights organization questions whether the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is binding or not. And this is because every day this Universal Declaration on Human Rights is used. So let us use our declaration as the legal basis for our demands. And in that way, we are going to make it be binding. Thank you very much. That's an excellent recommendation for everyone. I will now give the floor to Sonia, who has a question for you. Thank you, uh, Rapporteur. In our experience, we have found in Colombia that free prior and informed consultations are not free prior or, or informed. And this is actually turning into a mechanism to violate the rights of communities. It has become a purely uh, formal mechanism um, where the idea is to uh, defend, but really what it does is it legitimizes the different uh, interests that we see in our territories. And so I would like to know what you are doing in your uh, role uh, or what the Office of the Rapporteur is doing to ensure this uh, these consultations take place for pre uh, free prior and informed consent. Uh, this is so important in these debates on climate justice and climate adaptation. The territories of our indigenous uh, peoples are really the basis for human survival. So what is being done about this? My dear sister Sonia, uh, in my various interventions with the different states, I have been emphasizing exactly what you have just said. 
a free prior and informed consultation must not be simply a formal act. It needs to take place uh, in reality uh, and really follow, uh, be in line with what the um, International Labor Organization has stipulated. There are a lot of officials from the ILO that are carrying out these consultations simply as a formal step and not in the way that it should actually be done. Uh, I have no problem with uh, denouncing even UN uh, agencies like the ILO when they are not doing their job. There are uh, countries that have even uh, heard my uh, this denouncing that I have done, and uh, they have uh, we we have actually seen that um, states and agencies are collaborating in order to um, violate indigenous people's rights and thanks to uh, my denouncing of these acts uh, we have managed to bring a stop to this in different cases um, so you can send me uh, information to uh, to the email address that has been provided. There's a personal email address and the uh, address for the office. Please send any information that you have on this uh, to me. I am the rapporteur, but I am also uh, an Indigenous brother. Um, I am a Mayan. And I still have ties to the uh, Mayan indigenous uh, uh, struggles in uh, Mexico. So uh, first of all, I'm an indigenous person and I started in the indigenous movement. And so that is something that I cannot leave behind. So remember that I am uh, uh, here uh, to support um, these uh, initiatives that you are leading in your communities. Thank you very much, Rapporteur. I believe that we have four more minutes of your time, if that's correct. So uh, if we have any questions for the rapporteur before he leaves, uh, now is the time. Perhaps online, do we have any questions specifically for the rapporteur? Yes, we do. Uh, Catherine. Good morning. Thank you very much for being with us. I would like to um, bring up what uh, Sonia, our sister from uh, Colombia, said. Um, so carbon um, uh, uh, credits are causing a lot of problems because we've got companies that come and they offer uh, millions of dollars to people. They say, here, we'll give you a million dollars, but you can't touch your territory afterwards. Uh, is this something that the rapporteur is going to look into because it's very concerning for the future of territories and forests and uh, the climate because uh, planting tree trees is not going to solve the uh, problem of climate change. As our sister Mary Sol from Peru said, in order to conserve uh, the forests, indigenous peoples do not receive any funds. So there is something that is profoundly uh, unjust in all of this. Thank you very much, Catherine, for your question. Last year, I presented my study uh, regarding protected areas. This year, I am presenting my report on green financing. And I talk about the carbon market specifically and how it is affecting Indigenous peoples. So uh, please, I uh, would ask all of you, and I'm going to give you the, the homework, really, uh, download the uh, reports from the Rapporteur, and you will find some of the answers and some of the solutions to what you are dealing with, because I, I touched on those topics, and I uh, attempted to come up with recommendations uh, regarding what you are talking about. Thank you very much, Francisco Cali, for your interventions and for your time. It has uh, been very, very important for us to uh, count on your participation. So thank you once again. Until next time. Thank you. Thank you very much. See you next time. Goodbye. We're going to continue now with uh, the Q&A, and I have a question 
Okay, primero, coming from, uh, we'll go with, with the room first and then we'll move on to uh, questions online. Good morning. My name is Cristina Miranda. First of all, uh, excellent work, uh, excellent efforts. Uh, in the run-up to the Adaptation Futures Conference. My question is for my Peruvian uh, compatriots. Now, in this very complex political time that our country is going through, uh, as indigenous peoples, have you found uh, in this political situation mechanisms to be able to access the people who are making the decisions? Because we have heard the the demands um, and the complaints, and I want to know if these are actually reaching uh, the people they need to, or how are you pursuing your initiatives? What measures are you taking in you know within national indigenous organizations to ensure that you are heard thank you thank you for the question in the peruvian state we are going through a political crisis where the voice of uh, peruvians who are lucky enough to live in urban areas they don't even uh, they don't even have a say so considering the exclusion of the people uh, who, whose voices are never heard at all, uh, well, the situation is very critical. Uh, the Quechua people have been working on uh, in technical meetings in San Martin to see how we can work in our territories where these protected areas were set up. So last year, uh, Resolution 136, 2022, um, under the Ministry of Agriculture, uh, which includes an article that uh, allows uh, uh, people to uh, do, do something within these protected areas. But because the government is crushing indigenous people's initiatives in every way possible, they do not want to follow through on this resolution, um, but really they have the duty to fulfill it, to comply with it uh, in the name of all Peruvians, but they do not want to comply with it. And they are penalizing indigenous peoples for our actions. So it's uh, really drastic what we're seeing. So we already uh, ceased the uh, roundtables, our, our forums uh, for dialogue. We've seen how the Ministry of Environment uh, has no respect for even for per the Peruvian laws. And so we have called upon the Inter-American Court for Human Rights, and we will be there with our um, brother from Chile uh, to pursue this case because we have been uh, thrown out of two uh, of our land because of two different protected areas. So we've really uh, been pushed into a corner and we are not allowed to uh, make use of our ancestral territories. And so we cannot continue with uh, the same doing, making the same types of, of attempts in order to succeed at, you know, having our rights respected. We are seeing a basic violation of human rights, uh, human rights that everyone uh, deserves to uh, have respected. So the problem is that the state is um, looking out for the rights of multinational corporations, and they are they are not uh, considering the rights of families, women, children. Where our only uh, desire and intention is to survive, we have no other intention. But there is a campaign in San Martin uh, with all of the. Uh, the workers from the Ministry of Environment um, 
They are saying they are uh, spreading misinformation, saying that we are interested in, that we have interest in the oil uh, industry. Um, so there's also this smear campaign that is going on when in truth, all we want is uh, access to uh, clean water, air and environment. What we want to do is safeguard these spaces. And that is what the indigenous peoples are doing. I uh, represent the Quechua people, but this park uh, affects Kakataibo's uh, different uh, communities in four different regions, everyone needs to join this uh, struggle. And so I will take advantage of this moment to say that we all need to come together. We need to join our voices together because otherwise we lose strengths. And here, you know, we can agree on the fact that this fight needs to be uh, fought by all human beings acting together. How is it that we have the right to kill our own planet? We don't have that right. We all have children and we are at the point of no return. And so we need to fully understand the gravity of this climate injustice. Thank you very much. Do we have any other questions? If you could introduce yourself. My name is Zebra. I'm a postdoc here at McGill, and I'm Brazilian. And entonces así es. Yo voy a poner un poquito de de Brasil acá, donde la floresta amazónica, no, sesenta por ciento. Sixty percent of the Amazon forest is found in Brazilian territory. And I have been uh, study, uh, studying indigenous issues here in McGill for years. Studying indigenous issues is everybody's issues, actually. And um, what happens that I think that we, uh, as scholars, we miss, we no, on Gliss, a uh, very important part. Just to put some... Um, some uh, data here that I was thinking, because I've been, I just sent a huge project to Shirk uh, related to climate change. Can you, explain what, sorry. Can you explain what Shirk is, please? Okay, yeah, the Conseil, uh, I don't know how to say it in English. Uh, Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council. It's a, it's a government agency that funds research. Yeah, thank you very much. I, I only say in, uh, in the French, so, but, uh, um, just for you to have an idea, in the Amazon basin, the last four years, we had 498% uh, of rise in deforestation and mining. 57 children, died, indigenous children, died uh, from illness coming from mining, like rivers, uh, pollution of rivers and pollution of the forest. From 2018 to 2022, and this still, uh, now we change it, uh, we have Lula's government, so things are changing a little bit, but two, uh, in each two days, or every two days, cada dos días, un indígena muere a, an indigenous person dies while defending their territory. So thank you for talking about climate injustice, because I believe that is what we have to put on the table. What we really miss is that we don't put the right words in the right things. When we're talking about what we're talking here, we are not talking about justice at all. And when you say this justice, we give an idea that there is a justice and there's not. So this is something that we need to be aware. Uh, we need to be aware about reconciliation. Uh, on Saturday, Justin Trudeau said that uh, the reconciliation is not something related to ind indigenous and his words, because I, I, I saw his speech was from, uh, uh, belongs to us all, all. No, reconciliation belongs to us, non-indigenous. We are the ones that did all the bad things. I was saying another word, but I'm going to keep with bad things. So um, we always say a lot like make their voices heard or giving voice. They have a voice 
indigenous people, everybody has a voice. And that's wh where I wanted to say that as a uh, I'm a scholar in the sense of uh, researching and being with indigenous and being South American and being from coming from a colonized also country. So I share what all of you just said is that uh, we really need to pay attention because otherwise we're gonna uh, push one, one button like we're talking about the same things like in climate injustice and everything, but we don't go to the point. And the point is, it's not that indigenous or black or whatever uh, minority does not, do not have a voice. We don't hear. The problem is not them. The problem is with us. And we need to change, it's swift to this, uh, this, this key. We need to address this in our in our uh, congresses, in our researches, in our whatever we do. Otherwise, we don't, we're gonna take like two, three times more to achieve what you want to achieve. Uh, I, I, I will finish to pass to someone else, but I just wanted to, to highlight that because I've been like, I've been doing three big projects uh, related to here in Canada, each woman, a uh, white woman that is raped, for each woman that is raped, we have three indigenous women that are raped. So the problem is huge and we really need to hear, we need, need to pay attention. We, need, we, need, we have a, uh, um, an obligation as educators to put it to the students and to do it in the right way. It's just what I wanted to point because I think it's very, uh, well, it, it could be a, a nice, a nice moment, and thank you very much. I really, um, I'm really with my mi corazón con todos porque and my heart is with all of you because I am also part of this world. Thank you very much. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you very much. Hello everyone, I'm Camilo, I'm an anthropologist from McGill, and I have a question for Sonia, specifically because I heard, well, the answer to climate change is in the spiritual dialogue. And this is a question that I have always had and tried to solve. How do you do so that governments, agencies, civil society, the academia can understand the place of these spiritual beings. How, how can you do that? Um, Camilo, gracias por... Thank you, Camilo, for your question. Bueno, yo creo que... I think... A nosotros nos han enseñado that we learned eh, that in order to think the questions and give answers, you have to go to spirituality. We are Yahé people. So my dad would say, well, let's take some Yahécito and then let's talk to see what's guiding. So what guides us is spirituality, but part of the principle of respect, re to respect the other, to respect the territory where you live, and also the acknowledgement to move in that uh, uh, transformation of the, the, the the thoughts and to remove all this pollution from a capitalist world, everything is consumption, extractivism, so we are the most important ones. We are the center of the universe. We are egocentric. And we are going to take care of the territories only for us. But when we remove our shoes and we put our feet on the ground, we feel the energy of the territory. When you go to the river, you stay there silent. You could hear the other 
beings that live in the territory. This is not a metaphor. This is not poetry. This is not something that we are putting up indigenous peoples. This is reality. They have taught us, and we said here, or we acknowledge that the knowledge of indigenous peoples is not a minor knowledge compared to other knowledges. Epistemic justice. We also have, do science, and from our science, we are saying that in this world where we are, we have a coexistence right now, the spiritual world. So, in a way, maybe the science, the knowledge that is uh, as good as any other could have the same relevance in the dialogue areas and decision-making areas. There is no other way. It has to be a science included, and it has to be a science that needs to reach that category in order to have an influence where things are being decided on the territory. So if we connect with that spiritual energy from the belief of each one of you, of us, the diversity where we are, but also going to the teachings of our ancestors and the medicinal plants, we will find a real solution to all the things that we are mentioning here. This anguish we have, because we are not in the change, we are already in the change. We are in the no return point. We, If we do not transform the spirit, well, maybe we won't be saved. Thank you. I think your question is, uh, well, to understand the spiritual world is when we sleep. Our spirit leaves our body and goes to the spiritual world and the questions, the concerns, the spirit is going to answer. They will look for the answer in the spiritual world, goes back to our body and then we remember our dream and we have the answer. The human being lives in two realities. This body is here and we have another body in another place. So this is something natural that the humans, we arrived here from another planet in order to give life. I think the solution we are looking for, I don't think we need to spend billions of dollars in order to go to another planet and to find results. Our forest is a technology, is a science, is a knowledge. And there are a lot of answers there. The answers that come from the trees, from the wind, from the water the knowledge of the water, and also the knowledge of the universe. For us to protect the forest is part of our knowledge, and we also have salvation. Because if we compare to the study being done in the scientific area, I think we have reached a point where there is no return. But in the forest, we have a lot of ways out to struggle against climate uh, uh, change. So we don't have to be scared. We need to start to value the things we have and to find a way out because life will continue. Thank you. Thank you. Someone is here really <laughs> wanting to give a comment. So I want to pass the, the mic to Marisol. It's like sister was saying, 
We talk much more of, about the revolution, but it's not that we are going to stand up and do a revolution. We are not that. We are more spiritual. We have this connection and we have a respect that is basic. We wouldn't be talking here of in climate injustice uh, if without talking about respect. So we need a revolution of our thoughts and we need concrete actions that will bring us what Manari uh, is uh, saying. And I was uh, saying sometimes my spirit, when we are looking for answers, it goes to party. <laughs> and uh, sometimes we need to live and we need to have this connection with the spirit because when we bring the message from the territory, it is very strong because we leave a every day the impact of the lack of justice with the climate uh, issue and i'm making and i'm saying this because i have two children so i feel bad to to put them to 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 pick up the garbage and to and to plant trees but we have to do that because this is the area where we live and it's painful because we have this uh, life philosophy where we are entering the forest and this is the house of brother uh, tree and the water so we need to be respectful we cannot just uh, be uh, um, littering so we need to start to change our lifestyle and we will start to see that elsewhere. So we will start to see the answers and it has to be articulated. It cannot be uh, indigenous people here and the other over there, no. So I think it is time to hear the real solutions based on nature that we would like to share. Maybe we need a space, but for us, we need to be in contact with nature in order to talk about her, to understand. Well, that wind makes us able to transmit that feeling, that connection with the four elements that were mentioned yesterday. Thank you, Marisol. <laughs> I wanted now to ask a question from someone online. It says, I think it is relevant to ask ourselves who and in which context we are doing these initiatives, meetings with discussions, deep discussions regarding the complex uh, relationships among society and nature and this is from a western mechanized concept or are we taking into account to give uh, to open the door to cosmovisions of the americas that should have uh, started uh, with this with the presentation according to this person i think it's more a comment than a question. Another comment, the good life cannot become a joker in all the sustainable discussions in the international agenda and the states. It has to be done. It has to be this, the, in the middle of, uh, in the, at the heart of the discussions and the rest of uh, ways of life. I don't know if there is a, a comment, Carlos, uh, but uh, this is uh, what you decided to 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 have the process uh, as it is so i don't know if manari um, i would like to say something regarding this uh, good life the good life is a concept that came from the spiritual world the quichua indian world so the world, the good life, was to harmonize all the spirits that wanted to be in conflict. But one of the elders said, we are going to put the good life. So they harmonized the life and they stopped fighting. They started to live all together. But the concept 
appeared or was materialized in this world and it was interpreted in different ways because good life uh, thought uh, well some people thought that uh, in our country our president rafael correa said if i build a, a, a highway that's a good life so we said well good life is not to build a highway or to have a lot of food, it is something that is related to our life. If we are good without modern disease, diseases in our brain, if we are healthy, that means that we are in the world of the good living because our spirit is well connected to the forest and also connected to the knowledge that we are seeing in that place. So, under that concept, we teach people because the human world now is stressed, suffering of anxiety, many diseases. So, what we want to teach is apply this good life in order to get rid of all the diseases. Yes, I wanted to say as well that term, good life, as Ashaninka, how do we want to live as indigenous peoples? The good life for us, indigenous peoples, is how to live in our own territory without vul uh, vulnerating the rights to live with what we have, as, is, as Brother Manari said, spiritually. For, in order to see how, how we are going to live a a peaceful life, the good life. We want to have a sustainable development for the communities. So how do they want to live? So that's where it starts. It's not someone that comes and will tell me how to live. We need to eat what we have in the territories and to live in a safe territory without any uh, danger to 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 eat what we know so that also takes us to spirituality for us and our elders our wise ancestors the nature to live every day we need to meditate we need to have those dreams to come here. For example, my grandmother told me, you are going to go to a territory, a place you haven't been before. And when you will get there, you have to ask permission to the land where you are getting. And you have to use your saliva and then to put it in the soil. Because here I haven't found uh, only in the gardens some some. some soil and to put it in the in the forefront and to say this is also my land so please acknowledge me so in ashaninka this is what we say so we are in a world where we need to share our knowledge our this is also the good life so this is a, a good life with our own customs and we don't want to be imposed i don't want to have someone else to tell me how to live i would like to mention a conversation that i had with uh, some uh, um, grandparents and thinking about the territories and the people that live in the territory so the grandmother was saying well 
there is the tapir, the tiger. They have their own authority system. They have their community. She was explaining. They have their organization. There is a chief. There is a governor. They have some rules. And each species that live in the territory, they have their own system, political system. The plants, they have a spirit as well. They have an authority and they have their language. And also the good life consists in understanding and respecting this, that the presence of spiritual beings, the presence and organizational structures of plants and animals. But the concept must go from the abstract idea, sometimes it's like a poetry, to reality, where decisions are made. Because when you make decisions, it doesn't matter the spiritual system or the community that is in this other um, world. So we are the only ones that are important. And the grandfather said sometimes for some to have a good life is to have a house, to have uh, the road, to have money. But for us, to have a good life is to live in harmony with all the things that surround us. And I think harmony is maybe a concept where, well, maybe most of us can agree on. Apologies, but we're going to have to start to wrap up. We have two more minutes. I would like to talk a little bit about two interventions that were made regarding dialogue with Indigenous peoples. I think that although it's very easy to say, it's very difficult to actually do, and this is respect, respect Indigenous peoples. And I would like to provide three examples that we saw in the last uh, constituent uh, assembly. And uh, it showed us how people weren't really treating us as equals. In the first constituent assembly, we selected a chairperson, but very quickly, the most conservative political sectors uh, started to treat as us uh, as uh, people who were not equals and they kept using their academic titles and basically in that way showed that as indigenous peoples without academic titles we were not equals the second example was uh, that uh, those of us as indigenous peoples uh, had to do a um, constant uh, task of teaching people who were non-indigenous. So constantly uh, showing people and teaching people what uh, these uh, different different concepts were. So, for example, uh, you know, they would uh, they would talk about different sort of legal mechanisms, and they would try to explain to us, "Oh, what you're looking for is this legal mechanism or that," and we would have to tell them, "No, that's not what this is." Um, you know, they were trying to use these Western concepts in dialogue with Indigenous peoples, and it's possible to do, but it's very, very difficult. So, um, and then the third example was that we had uh, a colleague who uh, had, you know, all of the, the isms, if you will. She was a feminist, um, you know, uh, an environmentalist, and so on. But when we got to the point in the conversation, we, we were talking about we're going to, you know, look at the interdependence between Indigenous peoples and the environment. Um, and, uh, you know, they started to uh, talk about, um, you know, how we were actually sort of, we had a kind of a type of religion, if you will, and there was really a lack of respect towards our way of talking about things. So, 
I, and I will close with this, respect, uh, considering other people to be equals, even if they uh, disagree with you, because no one is saying that we're all going to agree on things, but we just need to treat each other as equals. I think that that is the basis for intercultural understanding. Thank you. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, we have to conclude this uh, conversation that has only just begun. So thank you to all of you, and thank you to all uh, those of you who are online as well. You've uh, um, asked very important questions. Um, we are going to be circulating the remaining questions, and then after that, we will have the time to post the recording, the audio, and the video on the website uh, for those who would uh, like to uh, hear what we had to say today. But now I would like to uh, finish uh, with a song. Bairoa is going to sing a song for us. We're going to improvise a little bit. Mana, Nairo to ya coe, Nairo to ya ya, Nairo tita to maua. Engaro ai coe, Iro to ito to toena, Eora maina. En aroa ekoe iroto ito uina gaena e ora maiena En aroa ekoe iroto ito uroroena ai mara mara ma So, this song says that mana, what we were mentioning yesterday, is in our heart, is in you, and in all of us. So, we feel it in our blood, in our inan, which is our spirit, and we feel it in our knowledge. So, man is there.